Uh, we've got 2 Timothy chapter 4 there. We'll take a passage. And this will be 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 21. 2 Timothy 4, verse 21. Now, the background of this passage is Paul in jail, and he's in jail for the last time. That is, he's taken out and beheaded after this one. First time he was in jail in Acts chapter 28, he got out and probably made a trip to Spain. At least he said he was going to come to Spain. And he might have gone on to England, I don't know. There's no historical way you can know for sure how the gospel first got, first got in England. But uh, Paul was ended that way after he got out of his imprisonment in Acts 28. And it's a funny thing, but England wound up with a big cathedral called St. Paul's. And Rome wound up around with a big cathedral called St. Peter's. And maybe Paul got up there. Anyway, the gospel got in England pretty early. And they gave Rome a hard time until uh, after the Reformation. But anyway, Paul's in jail. And Paul's in jail, and he's about to, be, about to have his head cut off. And uh, before he goes, he's worried about something. And he writes to Timothy, his... Uh, young convert, what he calls his son in the Lord, as a man, a young man he led to the Lord, and you need to follow the Christ, or you're their spiritual father. That's where a Catholic priest gets the idea from. Of course, he got it kind of screwed up because he didn't lead you to the Lord. <laughs> but the idea is he used to talk about my son in the faith, talking about Timothy. And uh, you take Timothy, he led, led him to Christ, he was a convert, and followed him. And Paul had a number of those fellows, Titus is another one of those. Titus has a bunch of young men he led to the Lord, and they wound up in the ministry. And he's uh, writing at Timothy right before he dies. We call this a man's swan song. And a swan song simply means that uh, you know, it's the last thing he said before he died. And uh, the last thing he writes is in 2 Timothy, chapter 4. And he gives a number, number of instructions there. He says in the passage, he says, uh, in one of the passages, he says, uh, Demas hath forsaken me. That's, a, that's Demas that uh, uh, loved this present world. He said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he says, only Luke is with me. He talks about the rest of his buddies. They've all forsaken him. He said, my first answer, he said, all forsook me. And that first answer is an answer before the tribune. What they do is they bring in, uh, they bring in a, a tribune, that's a Roman kind of Roman governor, and set him up. And then they'd quiz these Christians. That asked these Christians, do you confess Christ your Savior, or will you confess that Caesar is Lord, or something like that? And they asked him once, and give him a chance to deny Christ. And if he didn't, they give him a second chance to deny Christ. And if he didn't, they'd give him one more chance. They'd say, one more, and if you don't take this one, you go to the lions. And uh, they gave Paul three chances, and he said, at my first answer, all men forsook me. Which means when that tribune said, uh, Will you reject Christ and accept Caesar as your Lord and King? He probably had some statement just to put him on fire. <laughs> don't know what he said, but what he said, it wasn't very wise. He probably stood up and said, I'm not about to now or later and cut off my head and make mince meat out of me, but I'm not about to worship that devil. I'm going to worship Jesus Christ. <laughs> and everybody left him just like that. <laughs> all his brethren, all his brethren in the Lord, see, they saw the axe is going to fall. And he said, only Luke is with me. The last one that stayed with him right up to the end, right to when he got killed with Luke. Luke was a physician. I mean, Paul was sick all his life. Tell that to your healers. I mean, the greatest healer in that New Testament was Apostle Paul. He could get him healed by handkerchiefs and apron sent to him, like these fakes try to do. But Paul wasn't any fake. He really do that. He really do that, but uh, then there come a time when the God quit dealing with a nation of Jews as a, as a nation, Israel, and went to the Gentiles. And that took place of uh, the apostolic sign ceased. Now, you take, uh, you're not going to get that in any school or seminary, but the fact is, when Paul got to the end of his ministry, he couldn't heal a sick cat. You know what he said to Timothy? He said, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake, not off infirmities. He recommended medicine for him. Well, a fellow could heal people with handkerchiefs and aprons. What's he doing? Tell the fellow to take medicine. You know what he said one time right in, in 2 Timothy? Take 2 Timothy 4 right where you're reading right there. In 2 Timothy 4, look around that chapter somewhere. Do you find a verse there where it says, uh, he says, uh, uh, I've left Trophimus at uh, Miletus. Uh, I've left him there sick. 20, verse 20. That's the greatest seal that ever lived. I left him sick. 
Couldn't heal him, Paul? No, I couldn't. Doesn't the apostolic sign say, If they lay hand on the sick, they shall recover? That's what it says. Couldn't he get this fellow Trophimus get him healed? No, he couldn't. You say, why not? The sign of the deceased. That doesn't mean God doesn't heal, but it means God doesn't give the gift of healing to a man so he can just go around and lay hands on folks to get them well. You say, well, I know something can do that. No, you don't. You're just shooting off your mouth of what you're talking about. Neither, neither is your mother as far as that goes, although she might be a fine soul. If a man can lay hands and heal sick people, he shouldn't even be in the pulpit. Why, sure, <laughs> unless you're just a devil. You mean you don't have a big enough congregation in the hospitals? Why, if I could lay hands and full kill him, do you think I'd waste time here talking with you? I'd be in the hospitals 48, 50 hours a week going through the AIDS ward and the cancer ward, just putting my hand with people, trying to get my hands on them. It didn't say they had to pray. It didn't say they had to have faith. It said they lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover. That's an apostolic sign. You don't know of any apostles. The apostles go out with the Acts of the Apostles. <laughs> and the Acts of the Apostles ends in Acts 28. So Paul can't get his, his buddies healed here. And so he left them there sick. Now he can't get down to verse 21, and he said a number of things there. And then he's uh, asking uh, Timothy, he says, uh, I want to have you bring me some parchments. That's a, a, a paper to write scripture on. And some books. And he says, bring that stuff, a uh, parchment in the books. And he says, uh, then he said, do thy diligence to come before winter, verse 21. And I won't talk about that verse. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Now, why do you say that? Well, he said that because winters in the Mediterranean get pretty cold. And winters in Italy get pretty cold. They get cold. They get a lot of times 15 below zero and 20 below zero. And, 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 and a sailing time is hard. It's hard to get anywhere by boat at the, on the, at the, in those days. Uh, seas are bad, storms are bad at sea. So he says to Timothy, he says, do thy diligence to come before winter. Now, I don't know whether Timothy had made it or not. I hope he did. But nothing in the Bible will tell you whether he made it or not. He might have got there in time before they cut off Paul's head, I don't know. Maybe he didn't. It'd be a sad thing if he didn't. He said to Timothy, he said, uh, do your diligence, that means look to it, tend to it, be careful about it. And so we, we trust we trust that uh, Timothy got there, and before Paul uh, had his head cut off, he had time to finish his parchments, to write what he needed to write, and check his books, whatever he was checking on, scripture undoubtedly. And we hope he got did there, but we don't know. And the thought often occurred to me, suppose he hadn't made it. I mean, maybe he did. And like I say, uh, I, hope, I hope he did. Well, maybe he didn't. I've often thought in my mind, I thought maybe I ought to draw a picture about what would happen if he hadn't made it. I mean, Paul's about to have his head cut off. In this chapter, whether you read, you know what it says? It says, uh, I've kept my, uh, kept the faith. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. i fought a good fight. And he says, henceforth, the laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord the righteous judge should give me in that day, and not to me only, but also to all them that love his appearing. And I trust him that they got there, but if he got there late, you know what he'd have seen? He'd have seen that old apostle with his head cut off and traded off to a nameless grave. You don't know, nobody knows where the apostle Paul was buried. Nobody knows. To this day, he didn't have any, he didn't have any grave. He says, come before winter. This reminded me of something that I'm going to talk about devotionally from a devotional aspect instead of a doctrinal aspect. It reminded me. There comes a time in your life when it's too late to do certain things. Now, you take here in uh, up this part of the country, it gets cold up here. I don't have to be up here in the winter to know it gets cold up here. I mean, I've preached in Montana, and I've preached in Wisconsin, and I've preached in South and North Dakota. Not North Dakota. That's something else, man. Now, you get your north wind here from Pittsburgh, and coming down the Ohio Valley and Canada, that's, that's bad, but ain't too bad. You want to get your wind, you get out in North Dakota and, and uh, Wyoming. That wind comes in from Manitoba and Saskatchewan, Alaska, boy. I mean, 40 below zero, man, that wind 40 miles an hour, boy. I meant freezing Eskimo. <laughs> and the right kind of stuff comes up, you know what happens? It's too late to do some things. Uh, for example, now where I am, uh, we grow two crops a year. We plant in February and plant again in September. I doubt if you can do that up here. Maybe you do with some things. 
you know, and a greenhouse and cover them up and stuff and all that kind of thing. But normally you wouldn't be able to grow two crops up here. And up, up north in Ohio and up in, in Michigan and Wisconsin and Minnesota, they can't do it up there. You can't break the ground up there until May. I mean, the ground freezes up there some, it, sometimes it freezes 10 and 15 inches deep. Sometimes, uh, sometimes that thing will freeze down there two feet deep, 24 feet, uh, uh, inches, excuse me, 24 inches, two feet, 24 inches that ground is frozen. That's why those poops up there have, uh, they have uh, water pipes underground. Everybody up there in, uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, up through there in New York and Vermont and up in New Hampshire and through there, they all have uh, uh, basements. And they all have basements because you've got to get the water pipe into the house without it getting frozen. It's got to be three feet below the ground. It'll freeze up. And you take down there in uh, Pensacola, where I am, down there, the, uh, every year you have cracked water pipes. Uh, because every year down there, sometime, once or twice, it'll get down to about 10 degrees. And it won't be a long time, but it'll get down to about 10. Boy, it goes to 10, Pensacola. And there's just water pipes busting all over town. <laughs> Because nobody has any basements. In Florida, you don't build any basements to a house. In Florida, your house just sitting on top of the ground. And the water pipe's on top of the ground. And that, you forget to wrap that thing up when that thing comes in. And boy, I mean, pop, pop, pow, pow, boy. You got plumbers all over the place. People going crazy. <laughs> but you take those, that, those things are done to show you the certain time that things can't be done. And uh, there's, it, comes, it comes a time when it's uh, too late to plant. And there comes a time when it's too late to put stuff away. There comes a time when it's too late to play outdoors. There comes a time in your life when it's too late to do something you ought to get done, and what you better do is do what you need to do before winter comes. And then you won't be able to do it. And I want to say some things about that text. All right, the first thing I want to say about that text is this. It's a, it's a good idea, and if you're young, you can do it. And if you're not young, you can't do it. It's a good idea to form good habits while you're young. Best time to form good habits before you're 10 years old. There'll come a time you won't be able to form them. When you're young and have time, try and form good habits, form good habits. Uh, uh, if you have, if you had, you had as much discipline in the high chair uh, that you, as you should have, you'd have less discipline in the electric chair. I mean, before you, before you grow up, learn how to memorize. I mean, before you're 10 or 12 years old, learn how to memorize things. You say, why? There'll come a time when you want to memorize stuff, you won't be able to memorize it. You haven't taught yourself how to do it. You haven't disciplined yourself to do it. Memorize. Learn how to memorize things. You say, why? There'll come a time in your life when you want to memorize some scripture. You won't be able to do it. I mean, sometimes you get 30 years old, your memory begins to fail with that kind of stuff. You ever notice how easy it is to memorize popular songs, popular music, and how hard it is to memorize scripture? I'm mean, sad right here now. I bet I can sing you about 15 songs I learned between 1930 and 1940. That's before World War II. Funny how that stuff sticks with you, you know. And then you want to quote a verse of scripture, and you say, "Well, uh, uh, I know it's there somewhere, and uh, I just can't. Uh, you know, I, I wish I could." Yeah, uh huh. Well, make yourself memorize while you're young, and then you'll be able to memorize the stuff when you get older. And make 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 your body make make your body do what it's supposed to do. Start discipline your body. Uh, make, le learn what it's like to go hungry, not be able to eat when you when you want to eat. Learn what it's like to work overtime. You sweat and sweat and sweat and wish you could quit and can't quit. Toughen up when you're young. There'll come a time when you want to do something older and you want to do something that's right, you won't be able to do it. You know why? You haven't had any practice. You haven't any practice making yourself do what you don't want to do. That's where that character comes in. Character, I wish there was some way to build character except for the way I'm going to tell you, but I'm old enough now to know there's no other way to do it. The only way you can build character is by forcing yourself to do things you don't want to do. That's the only way you can build character. Uh, my flesh rejects that just like yours does. I don't want that. I don't like that. I'm one of the, I've got one of the most ungovernable types of temperament you ever saw in your life. I mean, I don't like any kind of government. I think best government, no government. <laughs> I've always been that. I've always been a rebel, with a cause, without a cause. I don't like instructions. I don't like the thing that says, keep off the grass. I'll cut across it almost every time. <laughs> Wet paint. 
I always touch it, see if it's wet, you know. That kind of thing. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just natural. I'm irritated, you know, by that kind of stuff. But I've had to learn that you've got to obey instruction, do what you're told many times, and you don't want to do what you're told. You know what young people do? They want to grow up. You know why they want to grow up? They want to be able to do what they want to do. You get here 13, 14, 15, 16, you just can't wait to get older. So you can be your own boss. I got news for you. The older you get, the more you're told what to do, man. You get up around 25 or 30 or 35, 40, the government tell you what you can grow and what you can't grow and how fast you can go and how slow you can go and how much money you hope to turn in and how much money, everything else. You never get away from it. And you can say, well, I don't care. Yeah, but there'll come a time in your life when you do care. Uh, I, 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 the tragedy of this age, and, and, and there's many tragedies in this age, but the tragedy I see, the tragedy I see in this age is, is I'm always in these prisons and talking with these young guys and uh, throw up these young guys in prison and they're going 18, 19, and 20. And man, I preach in prison where you have to have three felonies to get in there before you're 13. 13. You have three felonies by the time you're 13. Now, I don't free on me, but I was 17 when I got mine. I'm preaching out a kid who happened at 13 years old. Felonies, man. Not misdemeanor. Felony. I mean, like armed robbery kind of stuff. I preach, you wouldn't believe it, but the dying truth. I preached in places in the last couple of years when they came in there. A little old kid comes in orange pajamas. He's nine years old. Nine years old. So what's he in for? Murder. Killed his mother. Shot her. She was telling him what he, what he could and couldn't look at a TV and he went and got a, got a pistol and shot her. Nine years old, boy. Folks, there's something bad wrong with this country. Bad wrong. That don't happen in China and Japan, Iraq and Iran, and Arabia. Nine-year-old kids killing their parents. Something bad wrong in this place. And I watch those kids and those kids coming through there, they, they, they don't have a chance in this world, really. But you better form good habits while you're young, before it gets winter time. And if you're a parent, you better discipline the children before it's winter time. Someday those kids will grow up and those kids will want to do right and you know they'll find out they can't do and they find it out. They find out they can't do right. You know why? They've never made themselves do right. And nobody else made them to do right. Form good habits while you're young. I mean, uh, get off the cigarettes. Don't mess around with the cigarettes. You'll be a go-go girl at 16 and a huff-puff girl at 30. <laughs> When one talks about good habits, you don't suck your thumb, you tell a kid. Don't suck your thumb, you know. A modern kid says, well, you want to have me have buck teeth or be a, uh, uh, have a wart personality? <laughs> Go on and suck your thumb. Don't develop good habits when you're young. Uh, learn when you're young to control your imagination. Imagination gets wandered off the wrong stuff. Make it come back what you're supposed to be doing. You say, why? Because there'll come a time in your life, come a time in your life when that imagination will get in all kinds of filth and the stuff it should be in, and you want to get off it, and you won't be able to get off it. You say, winter, boy, winter. I mean, there'll come a day, it'll come up here at Mount Airy, it comes every year, it comes every year. You know what happens? The trees begin to change color. Wake up one morning, the frost in the windshield, you know. And just starting, just starting. That pretty soon the wind gets out of the north, gets colder and colder, and the trees begin to lose their leaves, and the branches get brittle. Pretty soon you wake up and there's frost in the branches. Pretty soon you hear the branches popping at night and cracking, breaking, got ice on them. You go out there and take your tiller and you can't cut through the ground anymore. It's winter. He says, come before winter. There'll come a time if the Lord tires, you'll grow up and you'll uh, want to have a family, have a home. And you'll want to marry a decent girl. You'll find you don't know any decent girls. By the time you find one, you'll find she wouldn't have you. You go up there about that time, some of you girls decide you have enough messing around, you know, and being the lady of town and being popular with the boys and this and that. You're going to settle down and raise a Christian family and raise some children. you find you haven't got any practice. You haven't got any practice. You haven't been made to go to church. You don't know how to make them go to church. You haven't been reading your Bible. You haven't been praying. You can't be an example to them. You're fixed. Your habits are fixed. 
They say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And there come a time when you want to, some of you young kids want to get rid of your Y ways and straighten up, you'll find you can't. You say the, the branch is frozen. So you, you mess with it, it'll break. Or uh, you take that snow and that ice, that's one of the most terrible things that any instrument, combat instrument ever had to deal with. I would rather fight any day in the jungles of Burma or Thailand or Vietnam, any day in the swamps and of Florida, or fight any day in some place like the bushes or a jungle than fight in a place like the Russian steppes in the winter. Amen. With 40 below and 50 below, and you pull off the guy's boot and his foot comes off with it, you know. And it's just like glass, bus, you know, that kind of thing. And your, fris your, figure, your trigger figure gets frozen on the trigger. And you're trying to put off a shot. And the tanks stuff all freezes up, and you put straw in there to keep the stuff warm, and the rats get in the straw, and, and again they start eating the wire from the tank, and the combat comes, you want to get the tank going, the tank won't work. I would battle accounts those actions in, in that war in Russia, well, honest to God, if I'd been a soldier, I'd just sat down and cried. I'd just sat down and cried, down in the snow. What's the trouble? It's that winter. They're called General Winter. I know the general, I know who the general was that defeated Napoleon. It was General Winter. I knew the general was that defeated Hitler when he went into Russia. General Winter. That's who, that's who did it. Now there comes a time Winter can stop things from the activities that you ordinarily have, and you no longer can do what you want to do. There's something you need to do before Winter comes, something else you need to do. You need to show kindness to loved ones before they depart. If you've never showed some kindness to your mother, you should show to her. You ought to show it now before the Lord takes her home. Uh, you ought to appreciate your parents. Let them know you appreciate them before God takes them. Pretty soon you'll take them, and then you wish you'd said some things you said, and you won't be able to say them because they'll be gone. I thank God when I got saved, one of the first things I did was go up to take a car, and I drove all day and all night and all the next day up beyond Chesapeake Bay, for my daddy was a retired colonel up there in, in Roboth Beach, Delaware. And I got up there and came in and got on my knees for my mother and father and asked them to forgive me for the way I'd lived as a teenager. And uh, I'm so glad I did that. I'm a guy on my knees and I apologized to them and I told them I got saved. One of them get saved. Of course, they thought I lost my mind. You know, it didn't make a difference to me. I, I had to tell them. And I, I know I caused them many a gray hair as a young man, many a gray hair. My dad had to, he had to call the police a couple of times, and a couple of times other people had to, and that kind of thing. And I remember getting down before my dad and mother and asking them to forgive me for where I lived as a young man. I'm so glad I did. After that thing, you know what happened? About ten years went by, and one summer, both of them died. Sister died in June, father died in July, and mother died in August, the same year. Flip, 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 like that. At that time, I had people up there in charge of things that hated my guts, and they didn't even notify my mother that they were sick. By the time I got the news about them being dead, they'd been dead and buried for more than a month. And I remember getting in a car and going up there to take a meeting with a fellow named Ingram in uh, uh, Frederica, Delaware, right next to where my daddy lived. And he took me up in the graveyard. He knew where it was. And took me up there and showed me that grave there, three of them lying right beside each other, my sister, my mother, and my daddy. I remember kneeling down looking at those epitaphs, you know, Colonel John H. Ruckman, so forth and so on, Marion Ruckman, you know, Mary Warner Armstrong Ruckman. And I remember thinking to myself, boy, I sure am glad I talked to them before they died. Boy, I sure am glad I don't have to kneel in this grass and say, Mama, there's something I want to tell you, Mama. I'm sorry, Mama, where I live. I'm sorry I gave you gray hairs. I'm, I'm so glad I didn't have to do that. I'd, I've Amen. done it. I've done it. You better do it. You say, why? Winter will come. I mean, the hearse will be there. The preacher will be there. The slab will be there. Down they go. Pull back the green map. Bulldoze the dirt in. Be too late. You know what you better do? You better come before winter. That's the chopping block here. This fellow's just executed somebody. My head's gone in a basket. Now down here, this fellow in his winter clothes, this is Timothy. He's got the parchments. He's got his gloves on. He's got the parchments. He's got his heavy clothing. 
And he came to bring Paul the parchments. But he didn't do his diligence to do it. He didn't get there before winter. And winter came and he got there just in time to see the corpse hauled off. There's certain things you should do. Kindness to loved ones before they depart. I, I, one of the saddest things I ever saw was a funeral down in Pensacola, Florida, where a guy had died. I don't know the cases at all, but he's a young man, maybe 35 years old. I don't know whether he got shot in an accident or killed in a car wreck or what. But his wife was there at the funeral. She's crying through most of the funeral. She's a young woman, about 28 years old. And when that uh, fellow finished the oration, I was just a visit. I wasn't preaching the funeral. I was just there to some friends of the fellow. And when he got through preaching the funeral oration, I had prayer, and they opened the casket and let people come by and look at the corpse before they took him out. His wife came by, this young woman came by there, and fell in that casket and grabbed that corpse and began to hug it, you know. Bad scene, you know. And she was saying, Jim, she said, Jim, I, I love you, Jim. Jim, I didn't step out on you, Jim. Jim, I didn't step out on you. I always did love you, Jim. I was true to you, Jim. Must have been some kind of an argument in the family, you know. I thought to myself, I hope he heard that before he died. I hope he heard that before he died. Maybe he did, maybe he did. But I'm telling you, when the ground gets frosted and frozen two feet deep, and <clears throat> the tree, trees or limbs are breaking, there's ice on the highway, there's, you can't go 65 miles now on the highway. What you think is, well, I'll always carry on like I do carry, and not in winter you won't. Winter comes, I, I preach messages up in north in the winter in Michigan up through there and take uh, cars to and from the airport. You get you get on that slick ice up there that mo some morning that thing is so slick where the light freeze and a light after a light slows the north. Well, not a big one, but there's just, just halfway feet freezing in the rain. I'm telling you, you don't drive 65. You don't drive 40, man. You don't drive 20. I mean, they come around turns up there and Greyhound buses just slide off <laughs> into the in the median, the way you take them out off, you step out of the car, fall flat in your face. That, that road out there, I've gotten out, out of a car and stepped on a road that was slicker than an ice rink. You can't do in the winter what you can do in the summer. Kindness to the departed. I have uh, one of my, I told you about him, Brother Nathan Bemis, a good friend of mine, a pastor out there in uh, Kalispell, Montana, fine fellow, loves the Lord. And he was raised out west, out in Colorado. Uh, a rancher's family out there. And uh, back those days, they didn't have all these rules and regulations, and they buried their loved ones on the property when they had a had a, a, a death and burial. Or, or they went out there and just buried them on the land where they all owned. Wasn't a lot of people around telling you, what you where you bury them, where you couldn't bury them, all that kind of thing. And they out there, he and his brother had to bury the daddy. They're out there by the grave, he and his brother shoveling dirt, you know. And they weren't saved. Nobody in the family was saved. And uh, they were shoveling dirt there, you know, and, he, and Nathan says my sister was there, and she was standing by watching her shovel that dirt in, and she was crying, and crying, and crying, and crying. Her older brother said, oh, shut up. Quit crying. Oh, shut your mouth, you know. Quit whimpering. And she was saying, I never told him I loved him. I never told him I loved him. I never told him I loved him. Well, that's too bad. Sorry, sister. Sorry. You're too late. You're too late. That's why Paul says to him, he says, do thy diligence to come before winter. Because there's a time going to come when you can't do what you want to do. Up here in these mountains somewhere, and I don't know exactly where, and I imagine stuff happened more than once like I'm getting ready to tell you about, but I'm sure it happened. Because I know mountain people, mountain folks. Back here someplace, maybe north here, a fellow back here, old mountaineer, and Moonshiner, and the unsaved fella, typical unsaved fella, had a wife, saved woman, typical mountain family. Woman saved, man unsaved. <laughs> and he was raising pigs, you know, and he'd raise pigs, and he'd sell his pigs, and when he'd sell his pigs, he'd get money for corn. And he'd get the corn to feed some more pigs with. And then he'd raise them and sell them to get some more corn to raise some more pigs with, so he could sell them to get some more corn to raise some more pigs with. <laughs> that kind of thing. And his wife, she'd complain. she didn't complain a lot, she'd clean out now and then, she made her all her own clothes. And because she made her own clothes, she thought well, she's entitled to something, and once in a while she'd say, honey, could I buy uh, several yards of this, could I go to the dry goods store, buy some, I get some Latin and silk and things I could make better, oh, that can't, well, you need the money. What for? I've got to feed them hogs, that kind of thing. And she all made her own clothes and worked up there 
hard living back there in the mountains, you know, and put food back on the side of the mountain, keep it over the winter, you know, that kind of thing, no refrigerator and all that kind of thing, dry most of your food, hang it out in the front, keep it. And she died early, early age. She died when she was maybe about, oh, about 35, something like that, after having about six kids, you know. And uh, he didn't say much at the funeral. And next night, someone went to see him, and he wasn't home. It was a rainstorm outside, rain pouring down. And they didn't know where he was, and they had look around for him. Find his horse was gone. Somebody said they saw him go down the road in the rain about an hour before it got dark toward the cemetery. And some of his friends went down the cemetery to see what was going on. When they got down there, he was out there, and he'd take it. He'd gone downtown that day and bought a whole bunch of yards of uh, fine cloth and stuff. And he had it draped over that grave. Down there crying in the rain. Hey, honey, I bought you some material. You can make you some clothes now. You're too late. The things you've got to get done when it's the springtime of your youth and the summertime of your youth. And when fall comes, you better get it on the floor. There'll come a time when you can't do what you want to do. So he says to Timothy, he says, uh, Timothy said, do thy diligence, he says, to come before winter. There's something else you better do before winter comes. You better discipline your children while you can. I tell them you better beat them up before they can beat you up. <laughs> And folks are all rocking how you talk. Yeah, I know all this modern slop, child abuse, and all that bunk. I don't. I don't take any stock in that at all. You take these these social workers, bureaucrats. They always say, you know, don't spank them, don't spank them, don't spank them. All the judges, all the judges say is spank them. <laughs> Somebody better get their get their house in order, man. The judges have to deal when the courts say spank them. I know of a case happened here in South Dakota here a couple of years back. Read about in the Christian Journal. And I had a thing affair with the guy who's always had trouble with his boy growing up. He's always getting out of hand. And finally one day at Sunday school, this fellow was, went to Sunday school and took his kids and family up there. And one day at Sunday school, this kid got mad at his wife, his own mother, this guy's wife, and smacked her. Hit her right in the face. And this guy smacked him three times and knocked him out right on the floor. The kid was about 16 years old. And right away, somebody phoned up the HRS, they called it H-E-W back in those days, and said, a child abuse, he almost killed him, he lost his temper, he hit him, why, he liked to kill him, you know, and they had the thing come to trial, you know, for a judge. And had a judge in South Dakota out in those days that had good sense. And he called the young man up and he said, did you hit your mother? And he said, yes. He said, how many times did you hit her? He said, I, I just slapped her once real hard. So what happened? He said, my, my dad punched me out, knocked me down. And he said, is that right? He said, yes, he's right. And the judge said, well, that should you teach you a lesson. That should show you, have to, show, show you ought to be careful how you act. <laughs> Good man. That's the way to handle that. That, that fun never got anywhere. But you get judges now, you don't have a fit about a thing like that. You better discipline while you can. I mean, there'll come a time they'll need it. I am the talk about child abuse. That's your news media. They're always picking some oddball situation and then trying to make everybody who's normal comply to it. That's them. That news media, one of the most dangerous things you ever had in your house. Amen. I mean, suppose there are some people that burn the kids with cigarette lighters, you know. And suppose there are some that put them in, in a closet, show them time up with a chain, all that kind of stuff. Don't tell me the average American family does that kind of thing. I don't believe you. Amen. That didn't even happen on the same families. Uh, for every family that happens in, there are 50 families that treat the kids half right and want to treat them right. Boy, don't spank the kid. Don't spank the kid. You know what I had a, 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 a warden of a penitentiary tell me one time? Maximum security out there in, a, in, a, in Texas. You know, he told me, he said, preacher, he said, we got men back here these days in these prisons we can't do nothing with. I said, what do you mean you can't do nothing with them? He said, they don't know what pain is. So we can't, we can't make them do anything. They don't know what pain is. They don't get spanked when they're babies. They don't get smacked when they're teenagers. They don't get kicked when they're older. They don't get slapped in the face. And they don't know what pain is, so how can you get them to do anything? You can't. You can't. You take you men here in this building tonight. You know what you're afraid of? I know what you're afraid of. Pain. Um, you don't want a kidney stone to last six months. Would you appreciate a guy taking a piece of galvanized iron about two inches thick and smacking your shin with it? Would you hop around a little bit? 
Let me put a cigarette lighter under the palm of your hand for about 15 minutes, okay? See if you move. <laughs> you want to scare men pain. A man that never suffered any pain can't be taught anything. He can't learn. You've got to have some pain to learn. You've got to learn that when you do something wrong, it hurts. <laughs> and if you don't learn that, you'll just be doing the stuff wrong all your life. That's why our jails are filled with criminals. I mean, I know what I'm talking about. You say, I'm standing here right here by the grace of God here tonight and preaching the gospel to you. Well, honest to God, if my hat, I, I had a good dad. He wasn't saved. But when it came to discipline, he was good. I mean, he whipped me plenty. And boy, I earned it too. I don't even understand this generation. They say, I don't deserve this. I've got my rights. Oh, shut up. I mean, I mean, when I used to get whipped, I didn't like him. I hated him for doing it, and I didn't enjoy it. But I never went out there saying I didn't deserve it. You crazy? Sure I deserved it. <laughs> I just, I'm just thank my lucky stars I didn't get caught all the stuff I could have gotten caught at. <laughs> Got some more. His instrument of torture was a bell. He had a big, he had a big steamer up a, a locker upstairs in the, in the attic, a big steamer trunk. And had a big bell around it, and that thing was about three inches thick and about eight feet long. He'd take that thing off and double that thing down to four feet, and boy, I mean, he would he would make me do the fair and go. I mean, I tell I tell him he's a patriotic father, boy. He laid on the stripes, and I saw the stars. <laughs> and and I, I found out a long time ago that the way to get out of a whipping was to was to run up and grab him around the leg. You see, and you start you break the fulcrum. See. And he, if you run, try to run from him, you're out there full length, boy, and whoosh, whoosh, boy, he got a lick on you. But if you run, grab him around the legs, it kind of breaks the thing, you know. <laughs> it's what you're giving us, Rockman. I'm giving you a sermon. You just don't recognize it. When God takes out the belt, you don't run. Unless you want to get the tar beat out of you, get in as close as you can get. Chris is stupid. The guy gets backslidden and he quits going to church, quits reading his Bible, quits praying. That's what will get your head knocked off, man. Get in close. And you take those whippings. Oh, I'm, they didn't hurt me. I said it hurt me to hurt the time you got them, but I'm here at this age. You can't find any damage on me due to child abuse. I've gone home from school many times, brother, with my underpants sticking to my tail end. You say sticking with what? Blood, boy. <laughs> Blood. I mean, walk home like this, you know. <laughs> and then you get home, you straighten up and walk like this up the stairway. <laughs> because if your dad saw you walking like this, out comes the belt and you get it again. You say, well, I'm bleeding the rear end, man. We can go on the HCW. Look at this. I got breezes on this. Yeah. I, I don't read this generation at all, man. I don't read them at all. That, that, that principal had a paddle, and that thing was four inches wide, and that was an inch thick, and it was that long. The brother got through with you, boy. I mean, you, you, you've been smacked. And uh, I just thank God I didn't get caught like I say every time, but I could have. It really been bad. I mean, I, I was in the vice principal's office so much. I was in the principal's office so much, they ought to have made me vice principal. That's the truth of it. <laughs> I remember one time I was stealing ice cream out of the out of the out of the, the lunch line. You know they have these little blocks of pink and white and chocolate ice cream. You know about that big in the school line. I was, I'm stealing things. You know I got me two of them, one to eat and I got uh, one in each back pocket. And I'm coming through there and I get to the end of the line. The vice principal waiting right there for me. He said, "Follow me." And I thought, "Oh, good night, good night." He saw me stealing this ice cream, but he didn't. He didn't. He got in the office and said, "Sit down." And I sat down there. He said, stay there, tell you to get up. And off he went. That dirty dog made me sit there for an hour. <laughs> and I sat there and that ice cream all melted, went down my pants, man, stuck all over that floor and stuck on that seat. And that bird comes back and bends over with a fiendish grin and he says, now you can go, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I could have shot that sucker. <laughs> But you take that kind of stuff, you take that kind of stuff, that stuff is good for you. It puts an element of caution in your makeup. <laughs> I mean, honest to God, if I hadn't got those weapons, I'd been, I'd wind up with Al Capone that bunch. My old buddy, buddy Woody Shunite, told me how to steal money from my mother and daddy in the billfold and their purse. And I learned second story work from another kid. How to get a car at night, lay down the street and act like you're hurt. And have your buddies hide behind a bush and jump out and get him. 
I mean, I'm talking about 1936. Well, you know what a hippie was. My old buddy would have shoot right. He found me down the road one night. I was coming back from a, a basketball game late at night in the winter up there in Topeka, Kansas. And it was cold up there. And I, 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 I kind of sensed somebody was behind me. And it's funny, when, you, when, you, when you're out there on the street, street-wise, whatever they call it, you get kind of instincts like an animal, you know. And I, I know somebody is behind me. I turn around a couple of times, look in the dark, I can't see them. I know they're back there. And so I get up to a, a light, a street light, get under it, get near the back of it, reach in, get my knife out, and get the blade open my pocket and wait. Here comes this figure up about, all oh, about six feet tall in an overcoat, and coming through the snow, and he stops outside the arc light. He's had a little train himself, see. If you're under the light, you're not silhouetted, see. If you're out there in front, you're silhouetted. But if you're under the middle of it, he can't, he can't get you outlined. And this figure stops, and I says, what do you want? And the guy says, I'm your old buddy, Ruckman. I'm your old buddy. I said, who, who's that? He said, Woodrow Shunites. You remember me, don't you? Woody? I said, yeah, you don't look like Woody. I hadn't seen him about three years. He got so big, I didn't know him. And I said, oh, oh, yeah, okay, Woody. And I stepped out there, and it was him. We walked along there in the dark, and he said, where are you going after you get out of high school, Pete? I said, I'm going to college. He said, oh, you ain't no college, Joe. You got no business being in college. I said, well, I got a rap on me. And uh, he gave me my choice of going to a uh, officer training in college and the citizen military training camp or going to Hutchison Reformatory. And I'd take a pick. And I, I took the college. And he said, oh, Ruckman, come on me. He said, man, you want to get the chips? I'm in the big time, buddy. Reached in his pocket and pulled out a roll of $100 bills. And let me tell you, man, back in 1938, Folks didn't carry rolls of hundred dollar bills. <laughs> they didn't carry rolls of ten dollar bills. <laughs> and you know what he'd been doing? Work up there with the gangs. You know what he'd been doing? Stealing cars, taking them across the state line, repainting them, putting lights on them, reselling them. And he said, Come on, we got the big time, Rucks, and make some bucks. I said, No, I promised my dad I'd finish and I'm I'm bound now, I gotta go. And he said, Oh, don't be a chump, Ruckman. He said, you can get in the big time up there. I said, I can't make it, Woody. I can't make it. i got to stay here. And so I stayed. Boy, about four months later, I pick up a newspaper to pick a daily capital and it says, Woodrow Wilson, Jr., this guy, arrested, uh, uh, sentenced, uh, four counts, federal offenses, st taking stolen cars across the state line, four federal offenses, ten years per offense, 40 years. But. And let me tell you something, back in 36 and 38, when a man got 40 years, he served 30 with good behavior. He didn't come out in three or four years. I don't know how much time that fellow served in, in, in that time, how much time he actually served out. But I know one thing, if that fellow served out 30 years, that was a terrible thing. A young man, he was 19 years old. If he'd served 30 years, he'd have been 49 when he got out of there. That's how close I came to it. And the only thing that, the only thing that ever saved me from that thing was a, a certain element of caution. I was afraid. I was afraid to break my word to my daddy. And if I hadn't, if I hadn't got the tar knocked on me a number of times, I probably wouldn't have feared him, but I did. And thank God I did. Amen. You better deal with them while you can. There'll come a time this country, this, where this country way it's going, is going to set up a thing where they'll arrest you if you whip your child. I see little boys in the, in the grocery store, little kid boys, you know, 10, 11 years old, wah, 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 mama, nah, 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 you know, and tearing up the whole grocery store. And the mother said, now, honey, now, honey, now behave yourself, honey, now behave yourself. I'll go by the mother and say, smack him, smack him, smack him. <laughs> <laughs> of course, she did something to work in the store, would turn her in, you see, that's, that's the kind of thing you get in. Smack the brat. One time a boy like that was raised came in the store like that, and kicking over stuff, knocking over cans and stuff. And had a young mother, you know, a divorce, you know, that's what you get. You get these divorced women, they get be about 25. They got a kid there, he's about eight years old. They can't run him anymore. And of course, no man around to run it. And he's raising cane, you know, and she's saying, now don't do this and don't do that. And an elderly man got watching that thing after a while. He came over that young woman and said, uh, young woman, would you like to have me bring that boy into control? And she said, I wish somebody do something. <laughs> And he said, let me talk to him just a minute. She said, oh, yes, go ahead. And she didn't hear what they said, but he went over there and bent over that boy and went, and stepped away and walked off, and that boy just 
kind of looked like this. He went to mom and got a hold of her skirt <laughs> and held on to her the rest of the shopping trip. <laughs> Kept looking behind him, you know. <laughs> Not another squawk. Went out the door and they met the old man out in the parking lot. And she, she got in the car and put him in the car. And then she said, the old older man said, what did you tell him? He said, son, if you open your mouth again, I'm going to knock your block off. <laughs> That's what you got to have. Now, you take, are there some women been able to raise some boys without a daddy? It's possible, but it's the exception. Sometimes a woman out in the country can do it. She's had too much interference with city folks. That's happened at times. But normally, you need a man around there. And the reason why is the, the woman, the woman, bless her heart, when a, when a male's a male, sister, and when a boy gets to be about 10 or 11, he can read mama out. And he understands mama is a female. And he can work her. Sit at the table. Junior, put that down. Junior, how many times have I said, put that down? <laughs> Junior, mama doesn't like that. You know, so, but if I just don't know, he, he'll keep on all day. Now, you the man there at that time, turn around and say, Hey, one more peep bullet. <laughs> just straighten out. Straighten out. I remember I went one time of a junior high school and my boys going to school. He kept complaining about his his teacher was a was a you know a, a, a fruit loop or something and, a, and just you know, had it in for him this and that and I, naturally I took the teacher's side. You have to. I take the teacher's side and the law side every time. I don't justify the kid. But after a while, it kept going so much. I said, well, let me start to go and meet the guy and see what he's like. And, so I went to the school where it was, a middle school, and I met this guy, and he, and he was just as bad as Mike's, the boy said he was. I mean, he, he, he might not have been a fruit, but he should eat, eat some raw meat or something. And, and time for lunch came, all the kids lined up out there in the cafeteria, pushing, banging each other, you know, poking each other, you know, the boys stealing the girls and all this stuff, you know. I mean, just like a glorified whorehouse, a middle school. All that stuff was going on. They're all yelling and stomping, you know, and spitting and hollering and screaming and stuff. But I said to the man, I said, uh, uh, you ever quiet those kids down? And he said, well, we've tried, but we just don't seem to be able to do it. I said, well, why don't you quiet them down? He stepped out in the hallway and he said, children. <laughs> all those kids turned around and looked at him, you know, and he said, please be quiet, you know. Turned back around. They just kept right on. They paid no more attention to me. He wasn't even there. And I said, listen, you want those kids quiet? He said, I wish somebody would do something. And I said, I'll show you. I stepped out in the hall. I said, hey! All those kids turned around. I said, shut up! <laughs> now you say, now you say, what, when do you do that? You got to do that when they're young. Pretty soon the winter comes. You won't be able to do that. Do thy jones to come before winter. The boy said to his daddy one time, you know, after he got in trouble with the law, he said, well, you could have pulled some strings for me. He said, you, you, should, have, you should have pulled some wires for me. He said, yeah, a long time ago, I should have pulled the stereo wire and the hi-fi wire and the TV wire and the telephone wire for a starter. Yeah. The young man went up to school and he flunked the school and uh, they sent him home to school. And uh, a couple times, and this boy was about, uh, oh, about 12, 13 years old, and his mother spanked him until he got to be about 13. And she was trying to raise him by herself and couldn't do anything with him. And when he got to be about 13, he came home one time, they sent him home. She got her whip, she whipped him with, and she gave it to him. And she said, come, let's come in the back room. They went in the back room, and she bent over and said, uh, now you whip me. He said, well, I can't do that. And she said, Whip me. Go on, whip me. He said, why? And he said, well, do you know what it hurts me to whip you? When I have to whip you, you know it hurts me? You think it hurts you, it hurts me worse than it does you. And, and he said, well, I... And she said, go on. Whip me. You might as well. You're hurting me anyway by the way you're living. And he smacked her one time and began to cry and said, Mama, I can't do it. And she said, well, that's how I feel about it when I have to whip you. And that got him straightened out. We had to see what was involved. But you got to do that when they're young. I won't work at 16 or 17. I told you about my, my boy, Mike. I have, I've got all my boys are over six feet tall. 
or one of five ten now, he'll be six feet four to get through. The big one is six seven. The next one is six five, and then on down. And those fellows, I told him, if you ever get big enough to beat me up, you can leave home. And I didn't have any trouble with any of them until Mike showed up. When Mike got to be about 18, he's too big to handle. I could put Pete down, he got to be about 25. I could put uh, Dave down, he got to be about 20. When Mike got to be about 19 or 18, I couldn't put him down anymore. And he was one of these fellows who loved that long hair. He liked to wear that long hair. And I told my boys, when it touches your collar, you get it cut. And all of them obeyed me except Mike. Mike could try me out. See how far, how long he could get, you know. How long is long, you know, that kind of stuff. One day he got down to his collar, you know, and I said, okay, buddy, tomorrow, haircut. He said, well, tomorrow's Monday, the barbershops are closed. <laughs> well, he got an answer, don't he? And I said, yeah, that's true. Uh, all right, Tuesday, you get it cut. So what if I don't? Well, I said, you wish you did. And he said, but I, you told me one time I got big enough to beat you up, I could leave home. I said, yeah, I meant it, too. He said, well, I'm big enough to whip you. I said, okay, get out. <laughs> and he said, well, I want to stay. <laughs> well, I said, okay, you stay. If you stay here and I pay your bills, you feet on my table, you get it cut. Amen, Amen. And he said, well, all right, okay, all right, okay. Well, I can still whip you. <laughs> and I said, don't bet on it. I said, you can't stay awake forever. And he said, oh, hey, you do it, too. You do it, too. Sure I would, man. What? I'll take care of that, brother. I'm not worried about be beating Hollyfield or Tyson up. I can whip both of them. You say, when? When they're asleep. <laughs> Get your ball by. What? <laughs> take that stuff out of you, boy. <laughs> you fix all you mean. Don't, don't give me that stuff. Mike is six feet two, plays in the church band, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, makes good money. Believe the book. Look at me. It didn't whip, all that whipping didn't ruin me. I could still jog out there three miles at night in my bare feet in that highway out there. I could still play hockey two hours at a time in 90 degrees weather with these young men. It didn't hurt me any. It was beating up ain't going to hurt you any man. Give you a sense of balance. <laughs> how many of you fellows ever lost, been, how many fellows in a fist fight ever got the tar knocked out of you? Let me see your hands at least once. Now there, you'll, you'll, you'll amount to something. <laughs> it's good for man to learn that, see? It just, it puts an element of caution in his makeup. <laughs> and if you don't do it, then pretty soon it gets, you get to be too old where you can't do it. Discipline the children. Discipline the children. I want to say something else. You better do this while you got, while you got it, while you got your health. You better thank God for what health you got while you got it. Maybe I'll be a paraplegic someday or a basket case. I don't know. You don't know what's in the cards for the Lord and that and this and that. But if every time it came where I couldn't walk or I couldn't run and about those kind of things, I thank God I wouldn't have to lie in a hospital and think, well, if I'd only thank God for it while I had it, if I'd only been thankful when I was in good health, I won't have to do that. If I get out there and get walking and get jogging at night, every step I take, I'm thanking God I'm able to do it. I said, up here, I'm 79 years old here in a couple of weeks and can I still do this. I ought to thank God I'm not in a hospital in a, in a, in a wheelchair. I got a lot of friends that are in wheelchairs. I got a lot of friends on crutches. I got a lot of friends 20 and 30 and 40 that are on crutches and wheelchairs. If a time ever come where I couldn't ever run anymore, or couldn't shovel dirt anymore, or dig post holes, or bust cement blocks, or till the ground, if that time ever were to come, and maybe it'll come for Lord Darius, I hope it doesn't, but if it ever comes, I'm not going to lie there and say, oh, I wish I'd, when I had my health, I wish I'd thank God for it. Man, I thank God for it. Amen. You say, why, well, winter ain't come yet. And maybe the time will come, you know. You know. Too late. Too late. He says, do thy diligence to come before winter. You better be thankful for your health. Well, I said to a man, he said, you look like you've been through a famine. He looked at him and said, yeah, you look like you caused it too. <laughs> well, I went to the doctor and he said, I'm a well. He said, he said I'm, you're well. He said, I hate for you to tell me that, doc. He said, why? Because he said, I sure hate to be well and feel as bad as I feel. <laughs> he, he, he told me, he telling me he was, he was sick. <laughs> One time, a little old boy, a little newsboy, didn't have much money, went by a pet shop and he went by there and he 
saw a little dog there in a couple of windows, wanted to buy my puppy dog. And he came there and talked to the man who ran the shop and wanted how much the puppy dog was. And he said, well, he said, the, those dogs, little puppy dogs, are $55 a piece. And the boy said, well, I haven't got $55. So all I got him was $5. You got any pups I get it for $5? <laughs> and the man thought a minute and he said, well, he said, not normally, no, not normally. But he said, uh, come to think of it, he said, I have a little dog here. And he picked a little dog, lame. And so this little dog here is lame. And they said, I, I'd let you have him for $5, but he wouldn't make any companion for you. You wouldn't enjoy him. Nobody else would buy him. And he said, this little dog here, he's, he's a pretty little pup, but he'll be limping all his life. He wouldn't make a good playmate to play with, and, and uh, you wouldn't be able to run with him, you know. The little boy said, well, I'll take him. He said, all right. He said, uh, you know, his little boy said, I'm, I'm that way myself, and pulled up his pant leg there and showed a brace on his leg. And he said, I know he'll need a lot of understanding. Because I did. Yeah. Bad middle pup. You still have two good legs? Yeah. How many people is building up two good legs? Let me see your hands. Amen. Um, you can stand up without falling down. Amen. You can walk. You better thank God for them. Yeah. I mean, Christians, Christians are as, un, they're as, they're as ungrateful about this as unsaved people are. Can you breathe? You'll say, well, look, when everybody breathes. No, they don't. No, they don't. I can take you to the hospital and show you hospitals all this country. Then they're going, the oxygen tent over. You do it before winter gets there. Then when winter comes, you say, well, while I had it, I sure enjoyed it. And while I had it, I thank God for it. And if I had to do it over again, I couldn't do it any better. So, Relax. When winter comes, you want to be ready for it. Do thy diligence, he says, to come before winter. You ought to be thankful for your health. I'll tell you something else you want to do. Any apologies that you have to make to your enemies, you ought to make them before they go and you can't apologize to them anymore. You having trouble with the brethren? Anything you ought to tell them you're sorry about? Some of the brethren? Maybe you better tell them now. Maybe you won't be able to later. Maybe later it isn't going to come. You know the best way to get rid of your enemies? Pray for them. That's one of the best ways. I got a telephone call one night from a lady after a meeting I had somewhere, and I forget where it was, but she got my motel number, I guess, in the past or something. She phoned me up, and she said, Brother Ruppman, I heard your message tonight. And she said, I'm under deep conviction. She said, I've been saved for a long time, but I've got somebody I've had an argument with and said, I can't forgive them what they've done. She began to cry on the telephone. She said, I know I should forgive, but she said, I, I just can't forgive them. I said, well, uh, you're going to have to to stay in fellowship with the Lord. If you want prayers to get answered, you're going to have to forgive them. That the thing I was talking about this morning, you see, you're forgiven for Christ's sake, whether you confess it or not, or forgive them or not. When he says, forgive not men that trespass, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. That's a bunch of Jews there he's talking to in the Sermon on the Mount. That isn't a bunch of Christians. Your, your, your forgiveness is not conditional, see, on how you forgive others, unless you're trying to get prayers answered. The context of that thing there is when you stand praying, if you have ought against somebody, go be reconciled to your brother and then come off of your gift. Got those differences. In plain words, if it's a matter of just forgiveness, your, your forgiveness is not conditioned upon how you treat others, but if you want prayers answered, then that's something else. You know what Paul says? He says, uh, for, be kind, tender-hearted one to another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Do you do that? Do you forgive them like the Lord forgave you? As God is my witness standing here tonight, there isn't anybody in this world I hold anything against personally. Nobody. My worst enemy. Nothing against them. I don't intend to get anything against them. When I get in trouble with the brethren, you know, and if something comes up and we disagree and have a falling out and this and that, maybe I can't always get along with them. Maybe I can't always live with them. Maybe I can't always trust them. But I always forgive them. You say, how soon? Right away. Amen. He says in one place, if your brother come to you seven times a day and say, I repent, you're to forgive him. They don't have to come to me. I forgive them before they, before they come to me. I do it automatically. You say, what? Just be safe. You know what I figure? Maybe I'm wrong. You know what I figure? I figure that if God has been merciful to me as he's been to me, 
I can afford to be very lenient with you. And I go by that. He says, as God for Christ's sake, he said, hath forgiven you. If there's something you ought to fix up with somebody and ask their forgiveness, then go to them and ask their forgiveness. Make the apologies. Now, again, you see, I, I know I'm on uh, tender ground here because I've never had things happen to me that have happened to some of God's people. And maybe if uh, God had what happened to me happen to other people, maybe it would be, I'd get in a position where I couldn't forgive. I don't know. I got a friend named Don Phillips, uh, who's a, he's a game warden down in Florida now, and he was in Middletown, Ohio for years. Say, fella, a Marine out of World War II. And Don Phillips, a fine fella, Christian, loved the Lord, believed the book, good with young people. And he had uh, uh, one son, and his son didn't follow his ways much and got him in the wrong crowd and finally got fooling the drug traffic and stuff. When he early, his son was about 15, when he finally got killed, and he got murdered by the gang he was with over some kind of a drug deal. And uh, they took him and tried to cover up the murder. They beat him to death with a ball bat and then put him in a car and then uh, put the car against a tree and uh, set it on fire. Burned it. Tried to make it look like he had a wreck and died in the burning car, you know. And somebody put the fire out too quick and they got a hold of him and found the ball bat bruise on him, the broken bones. And the three guys responsible for it were about 15, 17, and 18. And they tried them in court up there in Middletown. And uh, Don Phillips told me, he said, uh, when those fellows came into court, every one of them had a white shirt and a tie and a haircut. Oh, yeah. And they're just good big long-haired slobs, hippies up till then. Now they're coming in like Christian gentlemen, you know. And you know what he told me? He said, my, my attorney said, now in here when it gets rough, don't cry. And he said, I said, why not? His attorney said, that'll prejudice the jury and they'll call it a mistrial and let them off. Imagine telling the daddy that, going to court. You want to see the guys who were tried that murdered your son. And don't shed a tear while you're there. You'll prejudice the jury. Yeah. Something wrong in this country. Bad wrong. And so he got there and what happened was they gave two of them jail sentences. Short ones. They weren't life. It was something like 15 years. 10 years, because they were so young, and the youngest one, they let him off altogether and didn't give him anything, the 15-year-old, who was conspiracy, conspired in the murder. And you know what Phillips told me? Don Phillips, he said, I watched that thing, that thing was over and saw that, that verdict those fellows gave. He said, you know what? He said, I would lay awake at nights thinking how to get those boys. And he said, I'd like to see one of them die a slow death. He's a Christian, this fellow I'm talking about. And he said, I lie there at night and I just think about ways to get him. And he said, I knew some rough ways to make a man die. And of course, you're infantry and marine, or that, you, you know some rough ways to make him die. I mean, he said, I've dreamed about lying there at night and taking your fingers and just busting them bones one at a time, both hands and the toes. That's a Christian. Have to forgive. What's through something like that? I don't know if I can make it or not. But I know what I'd have to do if I was like the Lord. You know what he said when they were killing him? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's the business. I talked to a fellow one time down in Pensacola. Had his boy killed by a situation kind of like that. Murdered. And uh, he was a saved man. He quit going to church, quit reading his Bible, and mad at God and going to stay mad. I tried to reason with him and talk with him, but didn't get anywhere. And uh, finally, he said, well, I want to know something. He said, I want to know something. When my boy was screaming and getting killed, my Christian boy, where was God? When my son was dying, where was God? And I gave him the answer I'd read in one of Spurgeon's sermons. I said he was the same place he was when his son got killed. Yeah. He was right there, watching it and allowing it to take place. Amen? Amen. Romans 8, 28. But boy, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. He says, do thy diligence, he says, to come before winter. All right, I'll tell you a couple more things before we close. Uh, do Find something to do for the Lord. Get in the Lord's work. Your opportunity is to serve the Lord. Your opportunity is to give and support missions and things. You're not always going to have them. 
You take, uh, you take, there's no tax exemption for Mexican Christians. They get no tax exemption down there in the little Christian churches down there. It's a Catholic country. You get tax exemption here. It's easy for you to give. You better give while you can give. There'll come a time you won't be able to give. There'll come a time when they'll put an international tax on you for the UN. You swear you get that from Luke chapter 1 and 2. The whole world was taxed in the days of Caesar Augustus. It's not going to be an, an internal revenue. It's going to be an international revenue tax collector. You take those people in Russia and, and Germany, those state churches in Germany, those Baptist churches, they don't get tax exemption. They don't get tax exemption they're giving unless they're in a state church, Lutheran, Evangelist, or, or Catholic, a Catholic church. Oh, uh, if, 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 if you're going to have a chance to give, you, you give now. Well, I said, well, I'll leave it all when I die. I'll leave it all to the church. God didn't, God, God didn't say at the judgment seat of Christ that you'll get a reward for what you did after you were dead. <laughs> he said, every man received the things done in the body. <laughs> uh, sure, you'll give when you have to after you kick the bucket, but that don't count. You want to count, give while you can give. And there'll come a time that you won't be able to serve the Lord. God call you to the mission field, you better go now. It's the time you're not going to be able to get in the mission field. You say, why? The door is going to be closed. Now, right now, I know where they're open. They're open in Romania. They're open in Bulgaria. They're open in India. They're open in the Philippines. They're open in Russia. They're open in Mexico. Uh, the doors are closing right now in Russia. Slow but sure. They're not opening in China. And they're going to be closing some other places for very long. You better go while you can go. You better go before they start killing all the Christians and jailing all the Christians, which they're going to do. They've already started that stuff in, in China right now. Uh, Slick Willie bub, buddied up to Red China is really something. They're arresting Christians. Listen, I've got two Christians in the mainland in China that send me letters every month. I read them every Wednesday night in the church. I know what's going on over there. If CBS and NBC don't know, I know, because I've got young people living there trying to lead them to Christ. They're arresting pastors right now over there, and jailing pastors over there. And those doors are going to close. You know what you better do? You better, you better do something before winter comes, and you won't be able to do it. I'll tell you something else. Opportunities to study the Bible, you better avail yourself of them all you can. If you've got a chance to hear any Bible preaching, you better hear it. If you have a chance to study any Bible, you better study it. If you have time to read your Bible, you flat better read it. There's going to come a time you won't be able to get a Bible. There's going to come a time, if the Lord tires, your Bible's going to be taken from you. They're set up to get rid of Bible believers. For the Bible tells the UN to set up for the slaughter. And they don't want that book around. You take, if you're in Iraq or Iran, you couldn't have a Bible. You couldn't read a Bible. You take in Cambodia and Thailand, those places there, they won't let Bibles get into there. You better study it while you can. You take in Spain, World War II, Francisco Franco, the Roman Catholic dictator, he, he had Bibles burned. You better get it while you can. Back there in World War II, a lot of Germans were taken captive by the Russians and sent off to concentration camps in uh, Siberia and never got back. There were Germans there that were taken away from the home and never saw the homeland again. And one of those places, some fellow there had uh, he uh, picked up about four pages out of the Bible and he memorized all four pages, and he told a cellmate one day about those four pages he had, and he said, would you read them to me sometime? He said, yes. He said, well, we're off here next Sunday. He said, you come to my cell, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll read you these pages I've got. And the next Sunday, when the fellow came to sell this German prisoner, he'd taken his old dirty rags that he worked in and cleaned them up, and he'd got him a shave, shampooed himself, got rid of all the fleas and lice, and like he's going to a Sunday service and came and sat down there for about two or three hours and heard the fellow read those four pages. I've been in places where when you gave somebody a Bible, they kissed your hand and thanked you for it. I've been, one of my buddies gave a, a, a Russian lady a Bible over there and when gave that Russian lady a Bible, she said, uh, oh, thank you, and she kissed it and gave it back to him. And he said, uh, you're to keep it. She said, oh no. She said, that's God's book. And he said, I know, I'm giving it to you for a present. She said, you mean it's my book? And he said, yes. And she said, oh, but that's God's book. 
And he said, I'm giving it to you. She began to cry. Took it, knelt on the ground for him, kissed the book. <laughs> Some of you folks, you have five, six Bibles in your home. I bet you never kissed that book a day in your life. Time will come. Time will come. Hard times are coming. You know what you better do? You better do what you got to do before winter. And Paul says, do thy diligence, he says, to come before winter. That snow gets in the ground, that ice comes in, you won't be able to do what you want to do. I hope he made it in time. I don't know that he did. I hope when Smithy got there, he didn't see that body getting hauled off. The head gone. Beheaded. That one that was his spiritual father in the Lord. And it warned him. He written him. You know, when he, when he wrote to him, he said, uh, do thy diligence, he said, to come before winter. And I hope he made it. Listen, you better witness while you can still witness. The time, the time is coming when we preachers, we're all going to be in jail for tort suits. We're going to be in jail because we told people that were going to hell and they got psychotic about it. Somebody brought a lawsuit against us of uh, being responsible for the destruction of their dear little darling and the churches will be closed and the preachers will be gone except the ones that knuckle down. Tell what you better do, you better witness while you can. There'll come a time when they'll forbid you to witness. There are cases in this country already. I've got them at home. I've got them on file. I've got them documented. I got cases there where boys and girls are taking the Bible to school, nine and ten years old. And when they got there, the teacher took the Bible and said, we don't allow this garbage in here and threw it in the trash can. So now we'll give your mother and daddy 20 minutes to pick you up. If you don't, we'll turn you over to the authorities. That kind of thing. And it's going to get tighter. You better come while you can. Better, better, you better learn the book while you can get it. You better witness while you can still witness. They got genocide treaties out. And a genocide treaty is a thing where if you say something that indicates you hate a race or hate a person, that's a felony. Of course, they don't apply that to people they like, but they'll apply it to you. You better witness while you can. Isn't it strange how people get upset about lost animals and lost children, and they don't get upset about unsaved people going to hell? I got an article here I got from the paper out in Oklahoma in 19, let's see, uh, 19... Uh, 60, Owasso, Oklahoma, 200 people were trying to get a dog out of a collapsed mine where he'd been buried. They used dynamite and jackhammers, sirens running day and night. It took them six days to get in there and get that dog out. And they had an ambulance waiting there to get him when they got him. And they got him out. His name was Little Richard. And the big headline in the paper said, Every chance in the world that Little Richard will pull through. <laughs> and it was a dog. It was a dog. Now the whole town getting upset that like I'll have to get a dog from being lost. And the unsaved people, let them go to hell. Christian, let them go to hell. Won't speak up. Won't speak up. Finally, I want to say this. You better come before the winter snow and ice come in and prevent you from receiving Jesus Christ. That book says, Remember now the act creator in the days of thy youth. When the evil day is not come to come not upon me, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. You keep putting the Lord off and putting him off and putting him off and pretty soon you won't be able to receive him. I've never thought that God quits dealing with people. I believe he said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me. So I know he does. And that passage back there said, when he says, my spirits always strive with man. That's talking about a, your man as a whole, you know. As a, but as far as the New Testament is concerned, he said, when I'm lifted up, he said, I'll draw all men to me. I think God keeps dealing with the fellow and keeps dealing with the fellow. But you know what I think? I think when God keeps dealing with the fellow, there comes a time, there comes a time when he can't hear him anymore. And I've preached to just many churches down the south as I have up north. I've preached north, south, east, and west. That's every other weekend for 50 years. And I know the, the temperature of things. You know what's wrong with southerners? Southerners have read the gospel and heard it 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 to where some of them, I mean 50, 60, 70 years old, my, some of them, if Jesus Christ came to that door and sat down right next to you and put his mouth right in your ear and said, Hey! You turn around and say, Did somebody say something? <laughs> That's right. You get where you can't respond. 
You better respond while you can. You better respond while you can. Down there in Pensacola, Florida, we got a little old town named uh, Milton right across the bay from us. And uh, Jack Wood had a meeting down there one time, and a church friend of mine, a friend of mine, one of my graduates, one named Woodward, had a, had a church down there. It was a fun area of mine the church been praying for for several years. Had a good Christian wife, naturally. He's about 60 years old and not a reprobate. I mean, not living like the devil, but uh, no use for the Lord. They got him to come to the church meeting a couple of nights. And they put the pressure on him to receive Christ. And he'd say, no, I can't. They'd want to know why. He said, well, I just don't feel like it. And I'm a very stubborn man. He said four or five times. And the meeting went a week. And through the week, they prayed for him and dealt with him. And he'd come to church several times. They'd talk to him about his soul. He'd say, I'm a very stubborn man. And the last night of that meeting, as he's going out the door, after the invitation, he had a heart attack. Right there in the vestibule. And he fell down on the ground. They called the floor there, and they called the medics for him. And uh, the medics came while they are coming over. Jack Wood bent down next to him, and he said, Mr. So-and-so, wouldn't you receive Christ your Savior? Don't you realize how, how serious your situation is? Wouldn't you receive him right now as your Savior? And that old fellow lying on the floor, hardly able to move, said, I'm a very stubborn man. And he was dead. He yeah. took him to the hospital dead. What was that fellow's trouble was? He got the place where he couldn't act, and pretty soon he just got froze so solid that the limbs wouldn't even move. They're just stiff. Paul says, Paul says, uh, do thy diligence, he says, to come before winter. Too long I've laid me down to sleep and prayed the Lord my soul to keep. I should wake before I die and realize time is passing by. I should rise and tell the loss, despite my plans, despite the cost. Too long I've laid me down to sleep, while multitudes about me weep, and utter cries of dark despair for no one who ever seems to care. My life is short, and soon shall stand with sinners' bloods upon my hands, unless I wake before I die and realize time is passing by. Does that apply to you? A fellow said to George Truett one time down there in Texas, one of his church members who wasn't saved but been coming to church, they told him one time after the death of his little 12-year-old girl, back from the funeral, he said, Preacher, what's happened to me? He said, what do you mean? He said, I used to cry over things like that. So I'd even shed a tear at my little girl's funeral today. And he said, I used to be concerned about my soul, but I'm not concerned anymore. He said, uh, what's happened to me? What's happened to me? I'll tell you what's happened to you, boy. It's 40 below, and you ain't moving. You're frozen. You're in the deep freeze. You ain't going nowhere. That's what's happened to you. Over there in Milan, Italy, there was a caretaker over there. took care of a rich man's property. The rich man was a multimillionaire, and he was only home about, oh, off and on, a couple of weeks and a year. He had this tremendous, vast estate this fellow took care of. And this fellow was uh, Milan, Italy, and the fellow was oh, a millionaire fellow. Had this caretaker sit there all year round, take care of the garden, the shrubbery, and the walks, and, and trim the trees and everything, and put the right kind of fungicide and all this stuff. And one time a, a tourist came by there and saw that beautiful place, and he said to the man who uh, ran the place, the caretaker, he said, uh, do you take care of this thing all by yourself? He said, yes, I do. He said, well, are you working on it every day? He said, every day. He said, well, how long does your master come by to, to check this work you've done? He said, he comes about four times in a year, and he never knows when he's coming. He may come in at any time. And the fellow marveled at it and said, but it's amazing how much, how careful you are of that thing and take, around, take care of everything around here. You probably could sit down and do nothing most of the year. And he said, I suppose so. And the tourist said, well, you take care of this place like you thought uh, the boss might come in uh, uh, tomorrow. He said, oh, no, 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 I take care of it like he might come in today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he said, he might come today. Amen. You see what I'm driving at? Yeah. He might come today. Yeah. Maybe you better do what you've got to do now. You say, why? Because the winter comes, and the antifreeze freezes, <laughs> and the gun bolts jam, and you can't fire the rifle, and the tanks don't move, and the enemy's on all sides. Pretty soon you find out you got started too late. Too late. Do thy diligence to come before winter. I hope Timothy made it. 
I hope he didn't see the scene I'm drawing you right now. Maybe he did. I take for granted he got there and got the stuff to Paul before Paul died, and Paul had a chance to do whatever he wanted to do with the material you sent him. But maybe he didn't. And maybe old Timothy, maybe when he showed up there, he was seeing a procession going across there, some of the Roman soldiers taking a corpse off to bury it somewhere in an unknown grave. And then he knew what his, Paul had said, said what, he, what he meant when he said, do thy diligence to come before winter. Brethren, what you've got to do that ought to be done, you do it now. And there will come a time where you won't be able to do it. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless your word tonight. Speak the heart of your Christian people here tonight. They're waiting now. The trees to turn. It won't be very long while this blast will come down across these hills. And it won't be long before you won't be able to plow. You won't be able to plant. There won't be any garden. And, uh, what's there wither on the vine. Freeze up. And Lord, I pray for the deep breeze come, these Christians will get done what they need to get done and not waste any more time. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Personal question. Are you saved? Have you yet received Christ as your Savior? If you haven't, for God's sake, when are you going to do it? Aren't you letting some of you get the stiff right now? Been hurt down the middle of your back, bottom of your spinal column. Folks up here gray-haired, white-haired. One foot in the grave, another one ready to kick the bucket. Have you received Christ? Do thy diligence to come before winter. Are you a Christian here and you're not availing yourself the opportunity is to study the Word and pray and serve God? Why, right, before the north wind comes in and it's too cold to plow, do your diligence. Father, bless your Word. May it bear fruit in the lives of these that heard. Help them with the grace of God to be doers of the Word, not hearers only. I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Pastor, come ahead. Close the service out here to the Lord lead you.